Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now let's drop in for our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you? Better, Mr. Bell, thank you. And you? Fine, thanks. Ah, uh-huh, I see you've kept your promise to open your dispatch box and bring out your files in connection with the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Indeed I have, Mr. Bell, just as I promised. And a most macabre adventure it was, too. Well, I'm eager to hear it. So you shall, Mr. Bell, so you shall. But first, uh, am I correct in deducing that you have, you'd like to have a word with... Uh, with our listeners? <laughs> a most accurate deduction, Dr. Watson. Men, if you want your hair to look handsomely groomed from morning until night, use Cremel hair tonic. Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never gives hair that offensive, cheap, greasy look. Cremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Carpathian horror? It all began with this very letter which I have here in my hand, Mr. Bell. A letter from a most prosaic firm of solicitors. Holmes and I were at breakfast one spring morning in June 902, shortly after the end of the South African War. Holmes had been bored and restless, since the conclusion of our last case. And this was the first time that I'd heard him laugh the day. I must say, Watson, that the Morning Post has brought at least one unusual communication. For a mixture of the modern and the medieval, of the uh, practical and the wildly fanciful, this letter is really the limit. Oh? Why, Holmes? Listen. 24, Gray's Inn, London, June the 4th. Re-vampires. Re-what? Re-vampires. The legal mind is always precise, no matter how odd the subject. The letter goes on as follows. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir, our client, Count Paul Romani of Grazny and Carpathia, whose trustees we are, has made inquiry from us in a communication of even date concerning vampires and demoniac possession. As our firm specializes entirely in trusteeships and chancery work, the matter hardly comes within our purview, and we trust that you will be able to take the matter in hand. We hope you will call upon us at your earliest convenience with a view toward undertaking the case. Please ask for our Mr. Atterbury. We remain, sir, faithfully yours, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle, and Dodd. <laughs> Scott Holmes, that's the weirdest farrago of legal jargon and sheer nonsense that I've ever heard. I wonder, Watson, the mention of Carpathia is most significant. Significant of what? Uh, for one thing, that remote and mountainous section of southeastern Europe has been the stronghold for centuries of all the legends of vampirism. Oh, rubbish. Oh, come, come, Watson. Where's your spirit of adventure? After weeks of lying in the doldrums, here's a fresh breeze from the unexpected uh, environs of Gray's Inn. Come on, it's a beautiful morning for a walk. Where to? Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. And then, I hope, Carpathia. Second spots that I've ever seen. This is the worst. Not a light in sight, not a sign of human habitation. You dragged me two thirds of the way across Europe on what will unquestionably prove a wild goose chase. At least we have our fishing rods with us, my dear fellow, and we can always console ourselves with the promise of some of the best trout streams to be found anywhere. And you must admit that this mountainous Carpathian country offers some superb scenery. Mm, you might admit it if I could see it, as it's uh, black as the ace of spades. Two point of phrase. <laughs> ah, there we are. Here, look out of the window on this side. Now, there are the lights of the castle. Cheerful looking place, I must say. When did that fellow Atterbury say that it had been built? The first Count Romany built it in 1410. 1410? That's given it almost 500 years in which to disintegrate. A me a pile of stone if ever I saw one. Look at all those turrets and battlements. Probably damper inside than out. Well, we'll soon see. Aye, careful with that luggage driver. Careful. Here you are, my man. Oh, well, they follow that driver. You think the devil was after him the way he drove off? He shut up the moment he heard our destination. Evidently, the Count's local reputation is not an enviable one. Well, I can't say that we're getting a very warm reception. Well, they must have heard us, driver. Well, here's the dog, but I can't see any sign of a bell. And they seem a trifle short of modern conveniences. Let's try the knocker. Oh, I really 
you think this is perfectly outrageous, Holmes? Why the devil does... Esther Nam. What's it, sir? Esther Nam. Oh, pardon, Holmes. Uh, do you speak English? What do you want? Nobody can come in. Count Romania, see nobody. Uh, Count Romania is expecting us. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You got letter? Yes. Here. Come. What did I tell you, Holmes? Look at these walls. Simply oozing dampness. You, uh, wait here. There, Watson. That's better, isn't it? That fire will take the chill out of your bones. I need something to counteract the effect of all those family portraits. <laughs> Rum-looking lot, aren't they? Remarkably interesting collection. Curious how the family likeness remains unmistakable through so many generations. Well, judging from the looks of that fellow in the wig, cirrhosis of the liver must have been another of the family's inheritances. Hard-drinking crew, probably. Sir, Mr. Thomas. I'm Count Roman. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Thank you, Count Roman. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Dr. Watson, it was good of you to come so far. Uh, something to drink, gentlemen? Oh, a little something would go very well, thank you. Good. I don't know just how much my solicitors in London may have told you, Mr. Holmes. A very little, Count Romani. Uh, so little, in fact, that I must confess my surprise at your perfect command of our language. Oh, well, my father had me educated in England. Very sound, sir. Couldn't do better. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. I... I hardly know where to begin my story. The whole thing so horrible. Perhaps it will make it a bit easier for you if I tell you that Mr. Atterbury showed me your letters to him. Then you know that... that I believe I'm going mad. Or worse. Oh, Dr. Watson will bear me out, Count Romany, when I tell you that uh, people who really are on the verge of insanity never think it of themselves. Oh, no, it's quite so, quite so. I wish I could share that belief. But you see these portraits of my family. There have been strange legends coming down through the years of occasional weird and nameless horrors that have taken possession of each fourth generation. The fourth Roman yet died mad. The eighth lived out his life in the locked and guarded tower of the castle. And I am the twelfth Roman. All old families have legends. That's uh, hardly a basis for any fear. I, I quite agree with you. But some months ago, my father died, and I became the twelfth count. A few weeks later, I retired to bed one evening after reading quietly here in the library. Only to undergo a dream of such vividness that I shall never forget it. A rent of brightly colored corridors, their length stretching endlessly into the distance. Their walls echoing with strange, unworldly music. In my dream, I hurried from empty room to empty room through floods of brilliant, very colored light. I saw no people, no living things. Only the rooms of ruby and gold and jet and sapphire and emerald. At times the music seemed to be far away, thin and cold as though coming from the depths of interstellar space. And then again it would seem so near that, that I was certain I would find its source in the next room that I entered. In my endless search for I knew not what. At last, at the ends of time, I awoke to find myself in my own bedroom. Oh, but my dear fellow, my dear fellow, a vivid dream's nothing unusual. It wasn't a dream, Doctor. It was what I saw upon awaking in my room. My door was still locked, but the rug bore the imprint of wet and naked feet. And across the foot of my bed there lay, still dripping, some strands of weed from the moat of the castle. Surely there's a natural explanation for that. Yes, my boy. Are you by any chance subject to walking in your sleep? No, Dr. Watson. And even if I were, I could not have walked through a locked and bolted door. And the windows? The windows of my room give on the wall of the castle that drops sheer for 60 feet. Nothing but a fly could go up or down. Well, Mr. Holmes, the next morning, a dog belonging to one of the local woodcutters was found dead in the castle moat. And there was no blood left in his body. And the next time, time Count Romany, I'm certain there must have been repetitions to bring you to your present fear. The next dream came a few weeks later. Again, I saw the brilliantly colored rooms. Again, I heard the unearthly music. And when you awoke? I was in my bed. And for a moment, I thought that nothing was wrong. Then, when I turned up the lamp, 
I saw streaks of gray across my bedspread and grayish footprints upon the rug. Dust? Dust, Mr. Holmes. And a moment later, I received horrible confirmation of its source. For lying beside me on the pillow was the heavy, ancient, wrought iron key which unlocks the burial vaults of the Romany. Oh, extraordinary thing. Since your action in sending for me shows that you don't lack for moral courage, Count Romany, I'm certain that you paid an immediate visit to your family vault. Quite right, Mr. Holmes, quite right. In the company of my cousin Peter and several of the servants, and with torches to light our way, we visited the subterranean vault which is cut into the mountainside under the castle. And you found? We, we found that the coffins of the fourth and eighth Count Romany had been opened. Their lids shoved aside. The bones of my ancestors tumbled out upon the stone. Lord. Here, 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 my boy. Here. Drink this. You'll feel better. Thank you, Doctor. Well, now you understand, Mr. Holmes, why I sent for you. I do indeed. I consulted doctors. They gave me pills to make me sleep when sleep was the one thing I dreaded. The local priest spoke learnedly of exorcism and possession by the devils. But it could not put an end to my dreams. The servants have run away in superstitious fear. All except old Anton who admitted you. The peasants flee at the sight of me. Only my cousin Peter Hallis, who stayed bravely and loyally at my side, still remains with me. Mr. Holmes, am I mad? Tell me, am I mad? Or am I cursed by some fearful family taint? All that I can tell you at the moment, Count Romany, is that the priest was not mistaken when he said the devil has been at work here. I must apologize, gentlemen, for our limited cuisine. But with all of the staff gone except old Anton, our meals are rather scratchy. Oh, there. my dear Count Romani, your wine cellar more than makes up for it. Well, you know, if you would take my prescription, Paul, and get out on a horse every day for a few hours of hunting, you would have a better appetite. <laughs> my cousin Peter is quite a materialist, gentleman. He believes that all the evils of the flesh and the spirit can be cured by enough exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and I will wager that Dr. Watson agrees with me, eh? And I can. Well, there's a good deal to be said for your theory, Mr. Harris. Men sana in corpore sana, you know. <laughs> your cousin is, of course, familiar with the events you described to us earlier, Count Romanian. Oh, of course, Mr. Holmes. I've no secrets from good old Peter here. And what is your opinion of these strange events, Mr. Halash? Too much reading, too much thinking, too much brooding about the sins of our ancestors. I only hope that you and Dr. Watson can persuade Paul that all these dreams of his are just a lot of nonsense. Well, I hope so, too, I assure you. Uh, and now, gentlemen, I imagine you're ready to retire. We've had a long and wearying trip. A ring for Anton. Should there be a recurrence of your dreams, Count Romani? Please call me the instant you awaken. Good. Well, damp walls or no damp walls, I shall have no trouble sleeping tonight. I'm afraid you will, Watson. Huh? I intend that one of us shall keep the Count's door under observation all night. For heaven's sake, why? There's no doubt in your mind the poor chap is definitely unbalanced, is there? Is that your opinion? Well, certainly. Oh, you escape of delusions, I overheard. Poor chap, absolutely certifiable. Nevertheless, Watson, we shall keep watch. I'll take the first, and I shall call you at midnight. What's the matter? Watson, wake up. Uh, what's up? I thought you were on watch. Oh, I must have dropped off. I can't understand. Let me oh, wait. Uh... What is it? The Count. Come quick. Look, Mr. Mr. Holmes. My cousin. There in his bed. Good heavens, Holmes. There's blood smeared all over his hands and on the bedclothes. But no sign of a wound. Just a minute. I can feel his pulse. He's only fainted. Now what happened? I, I heard him cry out. Ran down to his room. The door was half open and Paul was lying across the bed. Just as you see him now. It is the curse of the Romany. Anton, stop that nonsense. No nonsense. Please say my master possessed by evil spirit. What's that? Sounds like someone riding hard. Coming this way. 
I will go to the door. You were right, Holmes. I can't find any sign of a wound on his body. I can't imagine where the blood came from. I very much fear that I can. What do you mean? Holmes. Holmes. Count Roman. Oh, my dream, Holmes. My dream. I had it again tonight. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. That's the police inspector from Brasnia. A young girl was murdered tonight. Oh, no. And the prints of a man's naked feet led directly here to the castle. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of Count Romany. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, get your money's worth. Enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. But Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. You simply can't beat Cremel to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened after Count Romani's third and most terrible dream? Well, Romani was such a, in such a state of profound shock over the horror that had taken place that I thought it best to administer a strong sedative. Leaving Anton to watch over his master, Holmes and I, with Mr. Peter Hallish, to act as interpreter, drove down with the police inspector to the home of the murdered girl. Ask the inspector to bring that lamp a little nearer, will you, Mr. Hallish? Jose de Olympia. Shocking, Holmes. Simply shocking. Her injuries look as though they'd been done by a wild animal. You're quite right, Watson. <laughs> My poor cousin. Oh, no court could hold him legally responsible. He'd have to be put away, of course. Hello, what's... What's all that shouting outside? It's the peasants. The news must have spread. They're shouting, To each our fellow Kosh, they burned the castle. Palalo Vampira. Death to the vampire. Hakazuk Sel. Hang him. Well, Holmes, we'd better drive back to the castle immediately. That mob's in an angry temper. They mustn't be allowed to wreak their vengeance on that poor mad boy. Quite right, Watson. I've seen all I wish to hear. Come, Mr. Hellish. We'd better be getting back to the castle just as fast as we can. As a medical man, Dr. Watson, do you think that there's any chance that my cousin under proper treatment and care might eventually be brought back to normality? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hallish. In fact, these cases generally grow progressively worse. Well, here's the poor fellow's room. He's probably still asleep from the effects of the sedative that I gave him. Ah, Anton. Is the Count still asleep? Well, speak up, man. The bed, it's empty. He's gone. Gone? Gone? He gone where you never find him. My master, no way for you to lock him up like animal. What shall we do? Where has he gone? Those peasants will be here within an hour. Holmes, what are you looking for? For well, something that should be here on the desk. Something the Count showed us last night. The key to the Roman burial vault. But, but why should he? Why should he take that, Mister Holmes? Gone right enough. Bring that lamp, Watson. We may yet be in time to avert the final disaster. <laughs> Careful, Doctor. Steps ahead here. The floor is very slippery. And this passageway must have been cut out of the very heart of the mountain. It was. They're deep in the rock itself. If all these twistings and turnings haven't confused my sense of direction, we must be almost under the castle. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The burial vault. Oh, you heard, Watson? My feet simply went right out from under me. Broke the lamp, I'm afraid. I know the passageway. It's not much farther to the burial chamber. We will have to go slowly, though. Make what speed you can. I'll keep my hand on your shoulder. Watson, do the same with me. I only hope it hasn't occurred to him to lock the door of the vault after he entered it. If it did, we're beaten. Be careful now. The passage bends sharp to the right. Just a bit farther along. Well, wouldn't it be more merciful, Holmes, to let the poor fellow take his own way out? After all, the best we can save him for is a living death in a madhouse. Ah, that's a glimmer of light just ahead. The door to the vault. The jar. He must have a lamp inside. He goes first. Oh, 
faint. I don't see much. What are all those big, bulky shapes? The stone coffins of our ancestors. There's something moving over there in the shadow behind that stone pillar. It's a count. He's got a knife. He's... Don't come from him. Be careful, Holmes. He's mad. Let me go. Let me finish this. Oh, oh, you let it stop. Drop that knife. No, no. Give me a hand here, Watson. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, you're wounded. Oh, it's nothing. Just a scratch on my head. Why did you have to interfere? I'd be better off dead. Come, Paul. You mustn't talk like that. Take the lamp, Mr. Harris, and lead the way. I want to get your cousin back up to the castle at once. <laughs> Against my rule to take a drink before breakfast, but this morning I'll break that rule. Thank you, Anton. Sit here, Count Romanian. And you, Mr. Hallash, over there. Anton, lock that door and remain in case I should need you. Oh, what is the use of prolonging the agony, Mr. Holmes? If you'd let me finish things down there. We haven't much time left, Count Romanian. The peasants from the village may be here at any moment. Well, then turn me over to them and let them do what they want. You know we would never do that, Paul. We will protect you no matter what happens, and no matter what you may have done. After all, you weren't responsible for your actions. I'm afraid I must correct you there, Mr. Halash. Count Romania is and has been fully as responsible for everything he has done as any other sane person. What sort of riddle are you asking us, Holmes? Are you attempting to deny Count Romania's uh, dreams, the episode of the dog, the very old vault, and the horrible death of that girl? I'm not offering a riddle, Watson, but its solution. Your dreams, Count Romania, had one feature which immediately led me to suspect their unnatural origin. You spoke of brilliant colors, of unearthly music, of a distorted sense of space and time. All characteristics of the dreams, or more properly, visions induced by the drug cannabis indica, more commonly known as hashish. Good heavens. And since you showed none of the signs of the habitual drug taker, it was at once obvious to me that your dreams were being induced by someone else. Someone who administered the drug to you in your food or wine on those occasions when they desired you to have one of your hallucinations. But last night... That girl, the blood... The blood stains were the final confirmation, if I needed any, that you had not committed the crime. The real killer slipped badly there. It did not occur to him when smearing the blood upon you and the bedclothes that during a four-mile walk from where that poor girl was killed, the girl, the blood would have dried upon you and not come off upon the bedclothes. Peter Hallash, have you ever seen an execution in this country? Why do you address me? What have I to do with all this? Who but you would inherit the Romanian title and estates? No, no! In the early I... hours of dawn, the prisoner is led out, his hands tied behind him, the priest walking in front and the jailers on each side. Mr. Holmes! He's led to this the same wooden enough. block in the center of the prison courtyard, where there stands a giant figure in full evening dress, his hands covered by white gloves, his face masked. It is the execution. Stop it! Then, as Stop the wicked man Holmes. is bent forward on the block, the executioner raises his gleaming axe high into the air for the final blow. I've had enough. I... Have you ever seen that, Peter Hannah? No, no. I'm innocent. I swear it. Do you think a judge will believe you? No. He did not do it. He speaks true. It was I. You should do nothing to harm him. Hands on you. I... This is impossible. I do it for my master and for revenge. But you never take me alive. Stop him, Watson. The, the window. <laughs> no need to look out of the window. It's a drop of a hundred feet to the courtyard below. Oh. And perhaps it was best it ended that way. But, Holmes, I, I, I still don't understand. It's not difficult if you study the facts. Oh, poor Anton. But why did you accuse me, Holmes? Anton's fanatic plot to drive the Count to madness or suicide and to see, see you in his place almost succeeded, Mr. Harash. When his sleeve slipped upward and I saw the cut he'd made on his arm to supply the blood, I knew that he was the girl's murderer. But there was only one way by which I could force the truth from him. And I suspected that his devotion to you was so strong that only an accusation against you would unseal his lips. I hatred that Anton must have nursed since childhood. I knew that my father had wronged his family, but... Well, I, I thought that was all dead and buried history. Not to a fanatical Carpathian peasant, Count Romanian. Mr. Holmes, you've given me back my life, my sanity. There was never any question of your sanity, Count Romanian. I saw that from the moment you first told me about the story of your dreams. Well, nevertheless, I don't know how I can ever thank you properly. If um, you and your cousin will introduce Watson and myself to some of your famous local fishing, I'll consider it thanks enough. And that uh, reminds me, Watson. Would you mind taking down a telegram for me? This little cut uh, momentarily precludes the use of my right a hand. telegram? Close, Holmes. Um... Oh, you'll find pen and ink on the table there. All ready. Who's it to? Mrs. Uh, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. Grays in London, England. How do you spell Dodd? Two Ds, Watson. 
re-vampires. Gentlemen, I take pleasure in informing you that I have brought the matter of your client, Count Paul Romany, to a satisfactory conclusion. Trusting to be favored by you with any further such commissions that uh, may arise, I remain your obedient servant, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> friends here is specially transcribed for you as a famous celebrity, that great authority on feminine beauty, the king of glamour, John Robert Powers himself.